Hello and a very warm welcome to uh, separation, isolation and loneliness. How we're all uh, dealing with this strange situation that we're in, how we can all uh, use this to move us forward. Uh, and you saw on the slides, just the holding slide that we, we showed up a little bit earlier, all the webinars and podcasts that we've been doing up to this date. All of those are, are free resources that you can find on the complete website. So I really encourage you to have a, a look at that. Um, we're going to be um, asking you to ask questions throughout this. Please put a question in the chat box or in the Q&A. But if you're putting it in the chat box, can you make sure that it says um, to panellists and attendees so the attendees can actually see what's going on and what's being debated and what's being asked? That would, that would really, really help us. So let's get straight on. Um, and hi, Alan. Um, I can see you're in your sunny T-shirt today. Yeah, the hottest day of the week, I think, this afternoon, Katie. So. Yeah, beautiful, beautiful. Mm. Um, so separation, isolation, loneliness, um, is it all bad? Well, uh, I think it's been very interesting. Uh, I've heard predictions that the divorce rate's going to rocket to the fact that we're all now uh, uh, at home with each other. Uh, but also, I've also heard people say uh, there may be a baby boom. Um, and I think this is one of the interesting things uh, of the times we're now currently living through um, I thought I'd share with you a sort of an interesting um, uh, bit of art here. So when we're in times of crisis, um, how do we respond? For some people, it's like the screen painting, uh, that very famous painting of somebody putting their hands, uh, uh, monks painting, or Klimt's painting, the kiss. So some people uh, do well in a crisis and, um, and some people do badly. So that's kind of largely what we're going to unpack today is what makes the difference. And essentially, we're social animals. So we don't necessarily, human beings, do well in isolation. But is it an inevitable consequence that isolation and separation is going to lead to loneliness? Is it necessarily going to happen? So that's what we're going to unpack today, You know, whether we're going to be troubled by this or whether we're going to find a way to uh, for it to be an opportunity for us and what it would be perhaps good to start with a, a, a definition now and you know what is the difference between separation isolation and, and loneliness right so um separation is really a physical distance so it's a physical thing you know uh, i am separate from you there's a distance between you're in one house i'm in another so it's a physical thing if you will uh whereas isolation is more of a state of being um uh, so it's the state of being that flows or could flow from being separate. So when we are a physical distance apart, I could feel isolated. Um, so uh, the separation is an observable phenomena. The feeling or not of isolation is going on inside of you. Uh, and that's different from loneliness, the feeling of being alone and feeling sad about that isolation. So loneliness is more of an interpretation of the isolation. So uh, if you like, separation is a physical thing, isolation is more of an emotional thing, whereas loneliness is more of a conceptual thing. And that's sort of quite interesting to us because if you look at the human system, uh, separation is more uh, a physical thing at the bottom of the pyramid. There's a physical observable thing. Um, the isolation is more emotional and the loneliness is more conceptual. It's a more complicated concept. So in terms of dealing with everything, uh, it's possible to interrupt the sort of domino effect, if you will, that separation doesn't need to lead to isolate a feeling of isolation and a feeling of isolation doesn't need to lead to a sense of loneliness. So what kind of what, what leads one to another or what stops that that process? Right. Well, first of all, we've got to recognize that we're all at a bit of a crossroads. That's what crisis does, is it brings us to some choices, some choices about who we are and how we are. Um, and as far as I'm concerned, there's a very clear path ahead um, uh, or clear choice. So as we're at this moment of crisis, which route are we going to take? Um, so if we take one path, we could get into the sort of stress, the anxiety, the worry, the fear, uh, and all the sort of health problems and in its extreme examples, a sort of PTSD, you know, post-traumatic stress disorder. Um, that's one path ahead if we don't manage effectively. 
uh, or there's quite a bit of evidence that people can go through terrible times uh, and have something, oops, have something called PTG, post-traumatic growth. And when I was doctoring, I saw a lot of this on the walls, is people would go through some terribly uh, difficult times. Uh, and some patients would end up saying to me, do you know what, uh, doctor, the diagnosis I got of cancer was the best thing that ever happened to me. And it's sort of weird thing to say, kind of paradoxical thing to say, like, what, what on earth do you mean? Well, it kind of woke me up. It made me realize a whole bunch of things about my life, about what was going on. You know, that heart attack, the best thing that ever happened to me, the diagnosis of HIV, best thing that ever happened to me. And you'd hear this quite, not from everybody, but you'd hear from quite a significant percentage of people who would take that path. And so that's what I want to unpack. It's not inevitable when we go through traumatic times and crisis that we do end up uh, with a problem. It's not inevitable. And so that's kind of what we want to uh, unpack today. Well, which route are we going to yeah. go down? And how does, that, how does that actually work? Or how do people determine that? Yeah, so is, this, uh, is stress inevitable as a result of crises? You know, and, and we know a lot about this. I mean, there's been years and years of research uh, about what happens when people are in difficult moments. I mean, some people may, you know, go back 50 years, may remember that what was called the Holmes and Rahi scale, which is there was this idea that if you had too many stressors in your life, you know, uh, death of a spouse was number one, uh, a divorce was number two, separation number three. You know, if you could tick off too many of these things, by definition, you were going to get ill. And so we've known that for 50 years. Uh, but not long after that, um, some research came out going, well, hang on a minute. There's loads of people that could tick every box and then some who never get ill. So fairly soon in the sort of 70s and 80s is we started to realize it wasn't quite a sort of linear relationship just because you've got difficult times or you've got a crisis or a tragedy happening. It doesn't necessarily follow. So then people became interested in what was initially called resistance resources, uh, you know, uh, championed by a, a researcher called uh, Antonovsky, and then something called hardiness um, which was uh, Suzanne Kobasa's work. And hardiness uh, often predicted longevity. So if people saw the crisis uh, as a challenge, I, you know, it's a challenge to be overcome, and I, and I sort of lean into that challenge. And if I've got some sense of control over what will happen to me, and I'm committed to trying to make the best of this, then they would come through. And there was quite a bit of evidence to suggest that what characterized something called the super young, people who lived into their 90s, you know, high functioning, uh, well into old age, is they had this thing called hardiness. Okay. But of course, if you get it wrong, if we take the wrong path, then you can get into um, loneliness. It can trigger the separation and the isolation can trigger into loneliness. And there's a brilliant book by James Lynch uh, more recently uh, called A Cry Unheard, The Medical Consequences of Loneliness. Uh, and James basically uh, went over some of the most famous uh, research studies in the world uh, in medicine and looked at uh, how much of the effect was not down to the traditional risk factors, but was actually down to loneliness. Uh, and he made it very clear, if you read the book, I mean, it's a brilliant treaty uh, on what happens if you start to go down the wrong path and end up in that loneliness space. And we're talking a moment about how do you stop that happening? Mm -hmm. um, but I thought we might just have a quick poll. What do you think? What's the quant? What's the health consequences uh, if you get trapped in a sort of sense of loneliness? So if we equate it to something that people know, you know, what do you think the equivalent is? If you feel lonely on a persistent basis, is that the same as five cigarettes a day, 10 cigarettes a day, 15 cigarettes a day, 20? How bad is that for you? Um, and so we're just seeing people starting to vote and guess <laughs> which one it is. We perhaps should have put zero cigarettes a day, Katie, because maybe we're leading the witness by saying it, it, it is actually. <laughs> maybe it has no effect. Um, <laughs> So most people Those here, are people who, are, who didn't vote at all, you know, I'm just yes. adding up the numbers and seeing whether every, everybody's actually voted. But yes, uh, well, I'm going, in to, fact, I'm going to end the polling there and, and share that one. Yeah, uh, well, so most people are saying it's 20 cigarettes a day, uh, which is very, it's very interesting um, because people overestimate the risk. It's actually about 15 cigarettes a day. If you're having persistent loneliness, it's the health impact of 15 cigarettes a day. Uh, ironically, by the way, people who smoke overestimate the number of years it takes off their life. Um, but loneliness has biological consequences. So at all costs, 
uh, we want to uh, avoid that. So it doesn't necessarily follow that if you're physically separated, particularly if you're physically separated against your will. Um, so people who choose to live on an island on their own uh, don't have any of these things because it's their choice. But what we're facing at the moment is that sort of physical separation without our sort of uh, you know without us buying into that. But there are many examples, and again, people will know about this. There's been some stuff out since we've been in the COVID crisis and the shutdown from people like Terry Waite and Brian Keane and John McCarthy. Um, I mean, Terry Waite was uh, physically separated from everybody, uh, chained to a radiator in in Lebanon uh, for the best part of five years. I mean, he had 1,763 days in a basement, uh, and a lot of those on his own in solitary confinement. So he's been, uh, you know, uh, quite vocal uh, recently to say, look, it doesn't necessarily lead to damage. And of course, the poster child for this, Nelson Mandela, 26 years physically separated in isolation. Um, uh, and so what is the How consequences? How do you survive in that, that, for that length of well, time? Well, this is what we're going to come on to. So is what, what can you do about that? Uh, and how do you survive to your question? Well, uh, first and foremost is you've got to do one of two things. I mean, first of all, they did a, a study, interestingly, with um, survivors or, of people who've been taken hostage and kidnapped. The CIA did a study saying, that, look, there's only two ways to deal with that kind of forced separation, is either you try to escape, i.e. you take action, or you do the work of emotional regulation, i.e. you learn to cope. So if you cannot escape, if it's physically impossible to escape, you have to wait to be rescued. But if you sit there every day waiting to be rescued and you get incredibly frustrated and annoyed by the fact that you cannot escape, it will kill you. So emotional regulation um, uh, is what's really required if you can't escape. And at the moment, we can't really escape from the shutdown. So we have to start to regulate our emotion, which is why in one of the previous webinars, we started to teach some skills about how do I get control of my emotion? I can't get out of this flat, this house, uh, this situation. So I'm going to have to learn to cope with it. That requires us to much more effectively regulate our emotions. So that's the first of two really, really critical steps uh, is we learn to deal with it. And we learn to deal with it by studying our emotions, by starting to understand our emotions. And most human, being, human beings have got a lot of work to do on that. So I was doing something with a client this week where we asked the question about how many emotions do you even know? You know, how many emotions do you know and you, have you experienced in the last week? And we gave them a few minutes. Uh, and, and in this particular workshop, people came up with about a dozen emotions that they recognized that they'd experienced over the last week. And then I said, well, how many do you think there really are? And they were shocked to discover there were actually 34,000 emotions. And most human beings are operating with a dozen. So our emotional literacy is very impoverished. So one of the things we could use this as an opportunity in this crisis when we're locked up effectively or in shutdown is to start to discover our emotional world and start to realize that not only can we find out there's all these other emotions we could explore, particularly the positive ones, there's 17,000 positive, there are 17,000 negative, which many people may be exploring at the moment, but there are 17,000 different positive emotions it's possible to explore. And so if we do the work, not only trying to find those planets, but how do I get myself when I have a natural wake up every morning and I start to feel worried about my future, about the economic situation, about the state of the world, do I, am I trapped then in that, on that planet of worry for the rest of the day? And the answer to that question is no, you're not. So the first step is to start to figure out, and that's why we did it uh, in two webinars ago, what you can do. How do you shift your emotional state? And how do I get good at shifting my emotional state? So that will get you to a point uh, where you'll minimize the damage. But there's something else. There's a second step, if I might share, mm -hmm. which is what we call the deep work. Now, this is the stuff that is game changing. This is in a crisis. Can I find meaning? And again, those people who've been through some terribly traumatic circumstances who found meaning in that crisis, absolutely healed. So the healing is in that deeper work. So coping is in sort of step seven. And that this wheel I'm showing you here, we'll, we'll cover that next week uh, in terms of uh, the nature of change. But uh, the step one or the step seven here, the work of emotional regulation, the deep work is how you actually turn the crisis into an opportunity is you find meaning in the crisis. What does this crisis really mean 
for me. And that's really what Viktor Frankl talked about, the, a brilliant book by one of the Holocaust survivors, Man's Search for Meaning. And it's very, very moving to read Viktor's book about how he coped, you know, where he was in a terrible situation where everything they could take everything away from him, and they did. Uh, but he found meaning in that. And therefore, after he uh, was released from the uh, uh, Auschwitz, uh, his life, he lived, lived a very meaningful life, as did Mandela. So it's not inevitable. So the way that you turn the crisis, you first of all got to learn to cope with it, you know, like those people locked in Lebanon, but secondly, start to find meaning in the crisis. So I think one of the really interesting things here is that um, uh, how do we turn this crisis into something meaningful? So there are some of the questions you can ask yourself. So what have I really learned from this crisis? What's it taught me about me? You know, being at home with my kids, what's that taught me about me as a father, as a mother, as a husband, as a wife, as a partner? What have I learned about myself? And what, what's it caused me to think about in terms of the choices I'm making for my life? I mean, I've heard some people start to think about, well, do I really want to go back to work? And other people going, I can't wait to get back to work. So what does that tell you about you? You know, what's it telling you about your life? What's humanity learned? I mean, one of the very interesting things, and we'll cover this in a future webinar, is how much will we have changed as a result of this crisis? There's a lot of noise at the moment, people saying, you know, it's an absolute game changer. We're going to change completely. But will we? And we're going to cover that in a, in a future. Will anything really change? Mm. So that's the meaning questions. Is starting to wonder. We've gone through some really difficult times and we've seen people die and so on. But what have I taken away from that? Can I convert this crisis into something meaningful? So that's how you heal. That's how you create growth, uh, post-traumatic growth, rather than post-traumatic stress. Okay. Uh, I want to come back to that, but I just want to ask you to answer one question that we've, we've had in uh, on the Q&A is, it, this is about the emotions. Is it the case that these 34,000 emotions broadly fall into 12 or so buckets that we're familiar with, e.g. happy, sad, anxious? Um, well, there's lots of categorizations, to be honest. So the, the simple answer is that there are many ways that you can categorize. You could say, look, all emotions are, you know, subsets of love and fear. You know, two emotions, love and fear. Uh, or you can do, well, below the two, you know, let's categorize 17 or let's categorize 64 or let's categorize, you know, 256 or whatever. So mm -hmm. there are quite a number of different researchers, Plutnik and many others, uh, who've offered various categorizations. Um, so rather than get hung up too much on how many different categorizations, uh, what I think is more interesting is think about the 34,000. Think about this as a universe of emotions. And what planet are you on? I mean, every day we wake up somewhere in that universe. So many people wake up every morning on the planet of not enough. Uh, you know, I, I don't feel enough. I, there's, there's something not enough about my life. I don't feel you know, rich enough. I don't feel I've got enough time. I didn't have enough sleep. You know, I'm not fit enough. I'm not healthy enough. I'm not wealthy enough or whatever it is. People wake up with this feeling of in some way not being enough, which is quite sad in many ways. So how would you wake up every morning on the planet of delighted? Wow, that would be a bit of a game changer, wouldn't it? If I woke up every morning feeling delighted. In fact, it reminds me of a, a story. I, mean, I was talking this through with a chief exec some time ago. Uh, There's a guy in his late 50s. Uh, and he had his five-year-old grandson staying with him. And at sort of five o'clock in the morning, the grandson snuck into his, and him and his wife watched as this little child was just sleeping. And then he watched this five-year-old wake up. And as he woke up, the look of excitement on the five-year-old's eyes, he, oh my goodness, I'm alive, another day to play. And this grizzled sort of 55-year-old executive looked at this five-year-old child and thought, oh my God, when was the last time I felt that? And it made him realize that he'd lost something. Something had happened to him. And that excitement of being alive had gone somewhere. You know, it's a very successful CEO, but what had happened? And so many people are, are maybe living their life on a planet they don't really want to be on. So part of the sort of trick is to start to learn to shift our emotion, as we discussed before, get to a different planet. But ultimately, can I find meaning in a crisis? Because then I can really create something of value. 
and, and I think sometimes it's about uh, just just starting with you know with with several rather than sometimes it can feel a bit daunting when you're looking at thousands of emotions. Um, you know, maybe starting with a you know with a with a smaller palette, if you like, or mm-hmm. a base palette of of emotions. Well, most people are starting with at best a dozen, right? So make it two dozen, you know. Um, so it, it's very interesting. So when people are wandering around, with, oh, you know, hi, or even if you're on the Zoom, you know, hi, how are you today? I'm fine. How are you? I think, well, that's interesting. You say you're fine, but maybe what you're actually experiencing is the feeling of not bad. Maybe what you're actually feeling is the feeling of so-so, or maybe what you're actually feeling is the feeling of all right, because fine, not bad, all right, and so-so, they're all different planets. And we've got them all bunched together under the word fine. So, you know, it's really fascinating. And so one of the things people could do uh, while they're in lockdown is start to explore the universe. You know, what planet could I be on? And how do I get from one planet to another? And of course, what's interesting about that is every single second of every day we're on some planet and every second you spend on a planet, you're reinforcing the gravity of that planet. So if you, you know, practice feeling worried, every second you stand, stand on the planet of worry increases the gravity and it, it traps you there more. So then eventually you're just worried all the time and it's harder and harder to get off. So, but interestingly, the opposite is also true that if you sort of deliberately sort of jetpack or get yourself over to the planet of patience or tranquility, you know, with some meditation or whatever it, it takes to get you there, then every second you spend in tranquility increases the gravity of the tranquility planet. Every second you spend on the planet of delighted increases the chance you're going to spend more time on the planet of delighted. Mm. I mean, I wake up every morning on the, I have to tell you, on the planet of pathologically cheerful. Uh, I mean, I've tried being miserable, but cheerfulness just kept creeping in. So I thought, well, I'll just live on the pathologically cheerful. And that's where I'll start most of my days. Um, So I'm just cheerful most of the time, partly because I've just practiced being there. And it's a nicer place to live uh, than some of the other negative planets. And it's just something you know, you mentioned delight earlier. You know, how, how many of us would really... Um, know if we were on the planet of delight, if we were feeling um, delighted, how do we check for that? How do we know? You know, and, and well, many people. It's a great question. You know. So just just starting to be curious about it. Um, I mean, uh, some some years ago, when my four boys were a bit younger, uh, uh, one of them, when he was about ten, uh, said to me one weekend, "Dad, I'm bored." I'm bored. So that's a very common thing for a, tea, for, for a young kid, not, not even a preteen. Um, and uh, I said, well, that, uh, that's interesting. You say you're bored, but how does that differ from fed up? I went, oh, well, what do you mean? I said, well, that's, what color are they? Color? What are you talking about? What color? And we started to talk about the difference between bored and fed up. And in that conversation, I got him to the planet of curious. Because he was then curious about, well, what is the difference between bored and fed up? So we start to have, so the very fact that you start reflecting on these things and wondering about these things and exploring these things can itself be helpful. So if people just start to use the time in shutdown to start to look inside, they can't go outside very much. So explore inside. There is an enormous universe inside of us that's waiting to be explored. And very interestingly, uh, fulfillment and enjoyment in, in life is an internal thing, not an external thing. So if you want to experience that, go and find that planet and see if you can get to the planet and see if you can stay there on that planet. But again, that's sort of step seven on the wheel of change we'll talk about next week uh, is getting that emotional regulation. So Terry Waite, Brian McCarthy, uh, John McCarthy, um, you know, even Nelson Mandela, when they were trapped and they were in super lockdown for years and years, this is what they did, is they started to explore on the inside. So it's not by chance that when you go around the world and ask people, and we've done this many times, you and I, uh, who's the most inspirational leader in the last 50 years, alive or dead? Mandela always comes top of those polls, always. Um, And he spent 26 years, he couldn't do much, Right? And then there weren't many people for him to relate to. So he cultivated his interior, his being. Mm. And he found not only that he could develop and live his life on some of these much more interesting planets. So, uh, but when he came out, he had a big effect. 
So he did exactly those two steps we're talking about, which is emotional regulation and then finding meaning in the crisis. You put those two together, it's a powerful combination. And a couple of quick questions. Um, is it possible to experience multiple emotions at the same time? I, I don't think so. I mean, I, I understand the thrust of that question. Uh, and I think it's largely that you're flitting between planets super quick. Because people will get to a certain planet and can't stay there, they immediately jump to another planet. Or what it is, is some planets look like they've got a, a few features of uh, planet A and a few features of planet B. So I must be experiencing you know, both of those both. planets yeah. simultaneously. And what I'd say is, no, you're on planet C, which is a halfway between both. So I think you're so it becomes actually... more and more subtle, more Correct. kind of granular in that, in that sense. Okay. Uh, Another question. How do you stay on a planet of delight during this crisis and hearing many, so many sad stories? Well, difficult, I'd say. Um, you know, so you really have to work at that. And also there's a certain level of appropriateness. So I'm not saying it's appropriate to be delighted when you hear so many bad stories. Um, but you could go to a, maybe a more appropriate planet like Compassion which is a very powerful planet to live on, uh, the planet of compassion. So this isn't to take yourself to an inappropriate planet. You know, let's be on the planet of exuberance when people are going through really tough times. That would feel inauthentic or wrong in some way. But you could go to the planet of compassion, or which we're seeing many of our healthcare staff, or determined. Determined because if you sort of sink into uh, uh, worry, concern, anxiety, panic, then you'll infect those around you, not with the virus, but with negative emotion. So this is particularly important to leaders. When we teach this to leaders, is leaders have a disproportionate effect, not to be in a sort of inappropriate positive state, so to uh, acknowledge the difficulty. So this isn't taking pride or, oh, I'm going to be vulnerable about my difficulty. Well, it, it's important, of course, to talk about your difficulty and to share that, to admit where you really are. If you're in a negative state, first rule is to admit where you are. If you're on the planet of uh, overwhelmed, admit you're on the planet of overwhelmed, but then start to chart a course to a more helpful planet. So, you know, it might be compassion, it might be determined. So it's very important that leaders in particular can do that because they are super contagious. In a crisis, we look to leaders and if the leaders are panicking and worrying, then it causes a much greater level of panic and worry. So leaders have a responsibility, in my view, mm -hmm. to shift themselves to a more helpful planet, not only for their own health and well-being and that of their fa friends and family, but for all the people they're leading. Okay, thank, thanks, Alan. Um, how can you deal with existential angst and being unable to find meaning or a point to life, particularly if you have no belief in religion or an afterlife? Well, uh, that's just one sort of meaning. Um, so uh, you don't have to have a religious um, uh, belief structure in order to find meaning in existence. Um, so maybe uh, there are different ways and, and finding your purpose in life, uh, as you and I do when we coach people, uh, help them to discover that, um, doesn't require a religious denomination, whatever the denomination uh, you, you may or may not buy into it's possible to find meaning that isn't constrained by religious denomination. So, for example, um, you know, some people can find meaning in caring for others. They don't have to have a religious belief in order to do that, but they find that work meaningful. Um, and so the discovery of meaning really requires you to look inside of yourself. Um, and so that's a slightly longer conversation, is how do you find your sense of purpose, your sense of meaning? And what I can tell is, as you and I have done for the last 25 years, had this conversation very often with uh, executives. Um, and I always say to them when we start those conversations, look, it is possible um, to discover this for yourself. Uh, and often I'll use this phrase that the, the, the two most important days of your life are the day you're born and the day you discover why. The day you discover why you were born. And that's your search for meaning you know, man's search for meaning. So if you read Viktor Frankl, he'll tell you what his journey was and what he discovered was his meaning. And then one of my personal uh, heroes, Joseph Campbell, in fact, one of my sons is named Joseph after Joseph Campbell, uh, the guy that inspired George Lucas to Star Wars, but was actually a professor of comparative religion and a world expert on mythology. Um, 
he said the purpose of life is to find your purpose, which is kind of a little bit tautological, but, um, or follow your bliss is another famous Campbell quote, is to find that one thing that really, really matters to you, regardless of denomination, and pursue it with a passion. Mm-hmm. So I've had this conversation many times. Everybody has a purpose. Uh, and a lot of people don't realize they have, uh, because it's quite a tricky thing to uncover but I've yet to meet a single person once you start to do that excavation that couldn't be moved profoundly by the discovery of their own purpose, why they were on the planet. Everybody has one. Without going into too much detail about that, how, how would one start to, di- to discover, discover your purpose? And does it well, change? It, it can evolve. Uh, it may not, but it can evolve over time if you develop as a human being. But one of the ways to do it is to do a little, wind the tape back of your life uh, and review what we call the tragic and the magic, uh, the high points and the low points, if you will. uh, And they're clues. So when you were living your best life at the age of 18, at the age of 26, the age of 35, or there are certain moments of your life that are sort of, you know, much more vivid. So, um, and there are moments where you made a crucial decision. You reached one of these crossroads, like I was showing you in the slide earlier on, and you could have gone left, you could have gone right. And you went left. So if you go back to those moments, and most people, and when we're helping them uncover their purpose, we wind the clock back and we go, okay, tell me about that moment. What was going on? What was happening? And what were those two choices that you were facing? And why did you turn left? What was drawing you down that left path? When you got to the next crossroads, you went right at the next one. What was drawing you down that? And because you lived your life, at the time, you didn't really have these thoughts. But when you helicopter above all of that and look at the entire tape, you can see the connection between these moments. So one of the ways of starting to uncover your purpose is to rewind the tape to these critical moments, these choice points in your life, and start to figure out what's the connection. And you'll find the connection is your purpose. Your purpose has been guiding you through, even if you didn't realize, but you just couldn't see it at the time. Yeah. Okay. Um, one other question we have is, is um, panic is a typical first response to a situation for me where that be about COVID or my future career. What yep. can I do to stop entering that state or emotion first off? Brilliant. Brilliant question. Uh, simply breathe. So we taught that in one of the previous webinars is because in order to panic, you actually have to lose control of your breathing. So if you look at somebody who's uh, in a state of panic, and again, I'll, I'll sort of see if I can act this out just to get this, the point I across. like this when you do this, Alan. Yeah. I like this bit, yeah. <laughs> well, you know, one of my kids is panicking, you know, when, it, when they're all grown up now, but, you know, five-year-old panicking, go, Dad, Dad. <laughs> and you'll see that their breathing pattern becomes incredibly disordered, right? And so um, what I was showing when, uh, say, Charlie, my youngest, who's now 19, um, you know, was five, was having a panic about something. Um, and I would get, breathe. And just as we talked a couple of webinars ago about a certain type of breathing pattern, which is basic rhythmic, even breathing, not deep breathing, not abdominal breathing, rhythmic, even breathing through the heart. So I put my hand on his heart and go, breathe. Yeah, yeah, but breathe. Breathe. And I would pace him and I would pace his breathing. Okay. And once he got control of his breathing and, you know, uh, sort of breathed in that rhythmic, even fashion, the panic subsided. Because panic requires disordered breathing. It's a bit like in the same way as Chopin's piano concerto requires the piano. You take away the piano, you haven't got the piano concerto. You take away the, the rapid, erratic, shallow breathing that goes along with panic, you haven't got panic, you've got something else. By the way, the same is true of something like frustration. The commonest emotion in business is frustration by a factor of three. And frustration requires people to repeatedly hold their breath. So, oh, yeah, oh, no, oh, oh ah, ah, kind of thing. You think, what are you doing? What are you breathing like that for? It's just bad habit, essentially. So you remove that breath holding pattern and install rhythmic even breathing you'll find the frustration melts away so what i'd say to that questioner is the first just get your breathing under control first that sort of stops you going backwards into a panicky state if you just stabilize your breathing then once you stabilize your breathing eventually you might be able to engage the forward gear which is move from a state of neutrality so that rhythmic even breathing will get you in state of neutrality and then you might be able to edge forward into maybe a state of patience right? 
So that's uh, one of the antidotes to panic is patience. So love isn't the antidote to all negative emotions. So all 17,000 negatives, the antidote isn't love, despite what the poets might say. Um, you find once you start to explore the universe, there are some emo positive emotions that are better antidotes than others to negative emotions. So panic to patience is a much easier move to make than pa panic to delight or panic to love. Mm. Panic to patience might be a better route to go. So it starts by stabilizing the breathing. So that would be my advice. Just stabilize the breathing in the way I've described first. See if you can stay, stick with that for five minutes. The panic will start to subside. And then see if you can edge forward into something like patience. Okay, we're just going to take one more question, Alan. Um, can your meaning change as you develop as an adult? Absolutely can. So if you mature as a human being, then your purpose can mature. So I'm on the sort of, I think when I last counted, the ninth regeneration of my own purpose. Uh, so when I started to become aware as a young man uh, of, of even the phenomena that there is this thing called purpose and it kind of matters, uh, I started to wonder what that is. Um, and I sort of reflected at my earlier sense of purpose uh, and it sort of transcended and included. So each time my life has uh, developed, when I, you know, I've gone on some other big adventure in my life, you know, career-wise or life-wise, is... Uh, my purpose has grown uh, as I've grown. So it can evolve. For many people, it may, it may not, or it might evolve, but in a, a subtle way. So the simple answer to that question is yes, it can evolve over time if you evolve. Okay. Um, having said that, one last question, last, last question. Given we're primarily social beings in the current lockdown, uh, we're separated from those we love. How can we help others to feel less isolated and lonely? Well, in the deep work, just by way of encouragement, uh, in the deep work, when you really go into this, loneliness is a mythology, right? Because the truth of it is, and, and this might sound sort of weird or just nonsense to some people listening, and uh, because you have to do the deep work to really sort of find out the truth of this, um, is we're not separate from each other. Um, so I often think, I learned this thing when I was uh, lecturing many years ago at an education conference in Kauai, um, and, and people from the Hawaiian Islands have this thing about, I don't know if you've ever seen this, uh, hang loose. So you have the, the, the little finger and the thumb up and the other fingers down, and you have this sort of hang loose. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, I, I saw that very interestingly. So as you and I are talking to each other, if people can, uh, if they're listening to this, not watching this, it might be a bit difficult to see this. Imagine you're the thumb sticking up. And you look across the flattened down fingers and you see me as the little finger. Um, and I look across and see you. So I perceive you as separate from me and you perceive me as separate from you. But we're really connected at the hand. So we're not really separate. In fact, if you look at uh, the ECG, the biology, the electrical signal of our heart, it radiates off our body about three or four feet. When you go to the doctors, they put the electrodes on your chest because it's just easier that way to record your ECG. But you can, with the right equipment, record the ECG about three or four foot off the body. So we radiate our biology. So our, 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 who we are doesn't stop at the skin. We radiate. I mean, if you watch police shows with a heat signal radiating up to the helicopter chasing the perpetrator across a field, we radiate a heat signal some distance. So we radiate biology. We don't stop in biological terms, we don't stop at the skin. So, uh, you know, if you imagine that actually the separation between you and I is a, a trick of the mind, we perceive ourselves as separate, but it's really a bit of a myth. And many people have experienced a version of this. They kind of sense their relatives, those people they love or are close to, they sort of sense that something's going good or bad with their relatives. And it's sort of scientifically inexplicable. But another way of seeing that is that we're actually connected in some way. Uh, with those in fact we're ultimately connected with all of us but the mind creates a perception that we are separate from each other but if you can really understand deeply that we're not really separate then it's not possible to be lonely because we are all connected ultimately in this sort of great web of life if you will we are all connected to each other and certainly globalization has done quite a bit for that kind of agenda you know on some levels we think we're you know because we're all members of social networks and so on that we're all sort of connected to each other certainly covid has proven we're all connected to each other um so ultimately when you do the deep work okay 
then it completely transforms your understanding of the phenomena of loneliness. And you get to an understanding that it's, it's actually a myth. But in the early days, so that might be a bit too advanced for people, but in the early days, just regulating the emotions, saying I'm physically separate, right? But that doesn't need to lead to a sense of isolation because I can decide whether that physical separation makes me feel bad or isolated. And I can certainly interrupt the tendency to drift to a planet of loneliness. If I can feel a, a state of compassion for my, my relatives or my friends who are also going through it, you know, we're not trapped. Uh, I mean, this is something that came out from Terry Waite, right? We're not constrained at home. We're safe at home. It's a different emotion. So if we can turn on those emotions and we can, fortunately, we have video conferencing now so we can connect uh, and certainly phones, we can connect with our loved ones. We're not as separate as we might imagine we are. So if we can hold on to that emotion that we're actually all connected, we are one. Humanity is one species, right? We are not as separate as you might imagine. And that, I think, is probably a brilliant place to, uh, on that thought, to leave it, Alan. Thank you very much, uh, uh, as ever, for that. Um, I hope you'll uh, join us. Um, thank you for your questions this week. I hope you'll join us next week, same time, same place. Um, this is uh, going to be titled, Will Anything Actually Change um, Post-COVID? Uh, making meaningful change uh, in terms of what we do, in terms of our relationships, and in terms of how we're actually being. And we very much hope that uh, you'll join us next week. And thanks very much. Okay, bye-bye.